Hi and welcome back to the channel and it's day six or day seven or day eight or uh, I've lost count. I know this much, it's Easter Sunday and the time's getting pretty tight. Okay, so let's take a quick stock of where we are with the car. Well, in the last few days I've got uh, the gearbox brackets sorted out so that the shifter works properly now. Um, also got the rear diff brace in which tied in the uh, T-bar, the moustache bar to the uh, rear cross member, so that's also sorted. Uh, also got some welding done inside the car as well, just um, some seam welding around the uh, seat cross members in the car and a few other little bits and pieces that need to tidy it up. There's a couple of welds that I wasn't happy with there that got sorted out so that's all done now so the interior is prepped and cleaned out also got a bit more tar off the floor there was still a fair bit of tar in there that needed to come out so that's all done now unfortunately haven't got time to paint it all and make it look pretty we'll just make it tidy for now and we've really got to get on to putting this interior back together and then get on with other things first task uh, get all these bolts sorted out on this roll cage uh, if you haven't watched the previous episodes worth a look uh, I uh, talk about how the bolts were put in the wrong way. Try and get all this stuff lined up in the right position and then hopefully the bolt will just come through. Right, so, um, always a good idea to have a uh, a washer on and you've got to use nylox. Um, the standard is that there's supposed to be two turns of thread through uh, each nylock as a minimum. Uh, you don't want to wound right through so I've used 30 millimeter bolts uh, on this one which is perfectly fine for the, the length that we're given and uh, once I've got them all in all around the cage and everything sort of into position I'll tighten the whole lot up properly. Righto, now then we can get on with putting the seats back in, which you'd think would be an easy job, however, is very time consuming for what it is. Once we get them bolted back into the floor, then we'll adjust the seating position and get it in the right place. This is some of the most time consuming stuff, adjusting seats. You'd think it'd be relatively easy with race seats, wouldn't you, but it's not. Like it, uh, you get asked all the time, like people go, it, it's only like four bolts, how come it takes so long? And like, this is why, because it's not just four bolts. You don't realise how much engineering goes into a standard seat, you know, just to make the adjuster rail pretty easy so you can get in and set it where you want and to fit a race seat, then you know. So adjust that buckle to where it's got to go. Keep sliding it up the harness till you get it in the right spot. Yep, and then go under first, and then over. Pull the pull the buckle in as close as you can back to the uh, to the pull. harness bar. Like that yep. yep. Pull it right through. That's it. And then just. Go back through the other one. Beautiful. That's it. Done. That's the shoulder straps adjusted. Subsequent movie film, very nice. very nice. So I'd originally planned to use a WRX radiator, however, remembered that the WRX has a header tank on it and the Impreza has a filler neck on the radiator itself. So had to buy a new radiator and put that in as well. Another difference in a downgrade from one to the other. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a crash course in engine management. The computer actually has uh, there's some sensors all over the engine that provide data to the computer and based on that data the computer then calculates fuel and ignition and runs the engine. So let's start with some of the basic sensors that the engine needs. Basically the engine needs to have a crank angle sensor uh, which is down here uh, just underneath the alternator 
and a cam angle sensor. Now basically the crank angle sensor tells the computer how fast the engine is turning and the cam angle sensor tells the computer where in the firing sequence the engine is. So is it on one, two, three, four? And based on that information it can then fire the fuel injectors and the spark at the correct time. Right, moving on from that, the next sensor that the computer needs or helps out with it is the throttle position sensor which is on the side of the throttle body here. Basically what happens is that, uh, as it says, throttle position tells the computer how far the throttle plate is open and then uh, using that it can then again calculate fueling etc. Next one uh, that it needs or helps out is to have an air temperature sensor. Now normally the air temperature sensor is mounted onto an airflow meter. In this particular case the air temperature sensor will be mounted into this plenum somewhere. It, uh, exactly what it says tells the computer what the temperature of the air coming into the engine is because the cooler air is, uh, the more dense it is and the better it burns. Now that is more critical in a turbocharged engine than it is in a naturally aspirated engine. However, it's still worthwhile having it. The last sensor that is really critical to uh, make this uh, engine run is what's called a MAP sensor or Manifold Absolute Pressure. Now, in uh, some cars like the WRX, they actually have an external uh, MAP sensor. Uh, in the, this particular case, the MAP sensor is actually going to be on board of the computer. So it's actually got a tiny little uh, sensor that's built in on board the computer. And um, what happens is we'll run a vacuum line from somewhere over here, probably off this port here, uh, inside the car, um, cl plug that onto the computer as well. And uh, using that, it works out whether there's vacuum or boost inside the manifold and then uh, it can calculate everything from there. Uh, probably the last sensor that the computer does need uh, um, as a critical is the um, coolant temp sensor. And as it says, it tells uh, the temperature of the coolant is the, uh, is the engine hot, cold, etc. Now based on those sensors there, the computer can work out where the engine is in its firing sequence and uh, given its temperatures and pressures, it uses uh, an algorithm in there which is called a map and it, with that map it can basically tune or refine the, uh, the fuel and the ignition required to actually drive the engine smoothly. Um, there are some other sensors that can be fitted um, on top of that as well that are usually in factory engines like an O2 sensor that uh, senses the amount of oxygen in the exhaust system and also a knock sensor so if the uh, engine is pinging it can uh, pick up the knocking and sort that out. So they're the inputs that are going into the computer. What comes out of the computer from there that's driven? Well, all four fuel injectors need to be driven, so the computer drives those. It also drives the coils as well. Uh, in the uh, Subarus, they use what's called a wasted spark system. So basically what happens is two uh, parts of the coil fire at the same time, and uh, one side will be an exhaust, so it's a wasted spark, it's not doing anything, and the other side will fire uh, that particular spark plug in the firing sequence. It uh, keeps things a bit simpler. So effectively, it's kind of like got two coil packs rather than four, even though there's four leads on the top there. Now, all of these are all driven by wires, and uh, all those wires I've already gone through and what we call pin them out. So I've actually tested each individual wire to each individual sensor or um, injector and other bits and pieces on there, worked out where they are in the wiring loom, and turned it into this. Now it may look like a confusing bunch of wires in there and to some degree it is, however each one of them has been labelled, I've gone through and pinned them all out, so uh, red green that's uh, one of the wires for the cam angle sensor. Uh, this device here is called an igniter, it's part of the um, coil system, it helps to uh, fire the coils um, to, uh, to give the engine spark. So basically what we need to do is this loom via these plugs here plugs into the engine loom and all of these uh, individual wires here will all be terminated or joined um, onto the, uh, the computer loom and once that's all done, theoretically, we drop in a, a base map into it and it should start and run. That's uh, fingers crossed. Okay, it's now almost 11 o'clock, Monday morning, five days to go to the rally. It's raining, as you can probably hear out the, uh, outside there, it's quite damp. Unboxing video. This is actually the first Haltech product that I've ever used. I've heard of them and, and known of them for a number of years. Um, mostly I've done plug and play ECUs. 
a lot of uh, Link or Vipec computers, a few Autronics, and uh, also done a few wiring computers, mostly Motec. This is my first Haltech. I did a lot of research on this uh, ECU, try and find one for the uh, Impreza to sort it out properly. And this is what I've come up with. It is an Elite 550. This is like basically the, the bottom or entry level uh, ECU. It will do everything that we want to run this car naturally aspirated. It will uh, handle a turbo car as well, but it's, it's pretty limited in its functionality. And with it, I have ordered uh, this wiring loom. Basically, I am going to splice this wiring loom, which plugs into the Haltech port, into the Subaru Impreza wiring loom, and uh, make a bit of a Frankenstein wiring loom out of it, and hopefully drive the engine. So, let's get stuck into it. Okay, so it's about nine o'clock on Wednesday morning. Couple of uh, very busy days. Yesterday, uh, spent the day wiring the car up and getting all the loom sorted out. Got a base map in it uh, late in the afternoon and it fired up pretty much first go, which was great. Um, unfortunately, didn't get to film that camera battery had gone flat. Uh, and then we had a bit of an electrical drama as I uh, let the smoke out of the wires and had a small meltdown inside the car, blew a fuse before it was too bad, thankfully didn't toast the ECU. Um, so then had to spend another couple of hours sorting that little drama out, uh, got it fired up again, yep, happy days, and then got on to other things that needed to be doing, a few bits and pieces like radiator fan um, wiring and um, sorting out things like the um, air box and uh, bits and pieces under the bonnet, tidying the wiring up, got it all together, went to fire it up, it was pretty late last night, about 10 o'clock, and uh, bloody thing wouldn't start. Uh, quick diagnosis, um, we couldn't work it out last night, pushed the car on the trailer, uh, it's not with us this morning, it's over getting an exhaust fitted at the moment, uh, so we pushed it off the trailer at the exhaust place, and then uh, we discovered in that process that there's getting no cam uh, angle sensor, so there's something wrong with there, and that was one of the wires that was potentially suspicious uh, last night. So uh, we're going to have to get into it again when we get it back from the exhaust place and replace that wire. Anyway, a couple of uh, quieter hours this morning while the exhaust is being done to uh, get the workshop tidied up. It uh, looks like somebody's throwing a hand grenade in here, so got getting around to getting that all tidied up, get the car back, get that wire replaced. Hopefully then we'll get it started and then it'll be off to the dyno for a quick tune and we should be just about there. Still a list of minor bits and pieces to be done, but it's, uh, it's, it's getting there. All right, let's keep pushing on. Righto, a uh, quick update. It's eight o'clock or thereabouts on uh, Friday morning. The rally is tomorrow and we should be sort of loading everything up and getting ready to go. And instead, uh, the car's on the hoist. Uh, this has really been a, um, <laughs> a bit of a battle to, to get this one done. Um, got it all sorted and running uh, on the trailer on Wednesday uh, evening. Thought, yep, okay, our, our woes are behind us. Uh, Thursday, so yesterday, took it to go on the dyno, to get the dyno tuning done on the Haltech, um, and went to drive it off the trailer, and uh, there was no clutch. Well, the clutch pedal worked fine, and uh, everything seemed to be okay. There wasn't any drama there. However, the clutch just wouldn't disengage. So we were lucky, our dyno tuners were um, very patient and uh, we pushed the car onto the dyno and they uh, tuned it by starting it in gear and, and doing what needed to be done and we got a good tune in it, which was, was good. Um, wasn't, um, it's not producing massive amounts of horsepower being a standard engine, but um, happy with the tune, everything's nice and safe and it'll do what it needs to do. Uh, put it back on the trailer and then brought it back to the workshop and uh, the gearbox is out. And I'll show you in a sec what happened with that. But uh, that was a very interesting one for us. So we're uh, waiting on some parts to come. Um, new clutch for it. 
Um, also, as it turns out, the rear main seal um, is leaking like a sieve, so it's an opportunity to sort that out while we're at it as well. The seal actually looked quite good when I put it all together in the first place. It looked like it was quite a new seal. I'd say just where it's been sitting, it's it's gone hard. So anyway, we, we needed to pull the gearbox out to do that. So uh, yeah, so this morning we got to rush and put this thing back together again, and then we should be ready to go to the rally. Uh, uh, fingers crossed. Okay, so after this crazy run down to the wire, we didn't have much time to test it. So the girl in this journey of this video is Tiana, and this is her first drive. Literally, shakedown was to drive it up and down the main driveway at about 30 kilometers an hour, just to make sure that it went into all the gears and uh, the engine ran before the rally started. No testing and no shakedown, the pair had their work cut out from them on the tight, twisty and dusty stages. However, they did a fantastic job and by the second last stage, they were into second place and holding it down with a comfortable lead of just over a minute. And then there was a final stage of the rally and it was a bit of a nail biter. It was just one kilometer from the end when the car lost all drive at a hairpin and that was the end of that. Unfortunately, Tiana and Graham had to retire. Bugger. After all that work and effort, we just couldn't get the car to the finish. Initially, we thought it was to do with the transmission. However, it ended up being a broken drive shaft. We discovered that this morning when we pulled the, uh, put, got the car up in the air and had a good look inside there and found that it broken just inside the uh, outer CV on the right side. It's a bit of a, a strange one, but that, as they say, is rallying. Anyway, it was a sterling effort for Tiana, just 19 years old, on her very first rally, and this series is going to change now and follow Tiana and Graham on their adventures in the Clubman series this year. So hopefully we can get the car sorted out and uh, go again for the Forest Rally, which is not very far away at all. Anyway, hope you've enjoyed this Club and Rally Car build. Please give us a like, a thumbs up, and share, and I'll catch you again soon. Cheers.